on and get your praise on. You know we got it going on at Third Church. At Third Church. Oh, well, the word is broken down for you. It's so easy, it'll make you want to move at Third Church. At Third Church. At Third Church. Hey there, Third Church family. Happy Father's Day. My name is David, and I want to give a warm welcome as we kick off our service on this wonderful Sunday morning. Let's jump right in and see what's taking place at Third Presbyterian Church. Are you new to Third Church? If so, we welcome you. Please take a moment to visit our website, thirdchurchstl.org 
slash connect and fill out our online connect card. Past supporters will then address any questions that you may have and make sure that you can find your fit within our church family. Have you missed out on our Tuesday and Thursday evening Bible studies? Well, it's never too late for you to join us. Visit thirdchurchstl.org slash Bible studies. There you can find the Zoom links, study materials, and access to past materials from the ongoing sermon series. Women of Third, it's that time. Join the women's ministry at their annual tea on Saturday, June 29th from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Wear your favorite tea attire as you fellowship and have fun. A sign-up sheet is available in the church vestibule. Juneteenth is this Wednesday, June 19th, and you know what that means. A new session of our Truth Be Told Black History class, led by Elder Lee Robinson, will be discussing the five civilized Native American tribes. The class is taking place via Zoom at 7 p.m. You can find the Zoom link on the homepage of our website, thirdchurchstl.org. We'll see you Wednesday night. Our ministry is continuing to help make a difference within our community, but we need your help so we can reach more lives. We have several ways for you to give, either online, by check, or through our giving app. Visit thirdchurchstl.org give to learn more and to contribute. Thanks for joining us this morning. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, guess what? It's easier than you think to stay connected to Third Church. Just click on that subscribe button. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about what Third Presbyterian Church is all about, visit our website, thirdchurchstl.org. Have a great week, and I will see you next Sunday morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We know that you're all powerful and all knowing. Father, we ask that you help us show love and compassion that your son, Jesus Christ, has shown for us, Lord God. That, Father, that you show us how to start the healing process and show our families that not only are you our God, but you are our rock and our salvation. Father, we also ask that you bless our pastor, Cedric, and his wife, Veronica, in a session, Lord God, as they leave our church. Father, we ask that you continue to bless our members and their families, and we receive in expectation in advance for the new members that are to come. In Jesus' name, amen.
And good morning, Third Church family. Great news today. We begin a new study. And as we begin the study of First Kings, it is important to give some history regarding this book in order to reach a greater understanding of the context as we go through this historical account. So the very purpose of this book is to give the Israelites a permanent history of their kingdom, a history of their kings from a moral and spiritual perspective. The focus of the book is the moral and spiritual evaluation of the kings and the ministries of the prophets. Every king is measured against the righteous reign of David to which they all should have aspired. Every king is judged either righteous or evil in the sight of God. Now, 1 Kings was written in a time of civil, moral, and spiritual decline. This account is written to teach the utter necessity of building our lives and society upon the Lord and his commandments and to warn them of the judgment to come unless they repented and returned to the Lord. Obey God's law, his commandments, reject all false worship, worshiping the Lord and him alone, Govern with compassion, executing true justice and righteousness throughout the land are the main points of these books we will study over the next several months. So as we begin today, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, hear these words. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at high places because a temple had not yet been built in the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father, David. 
except that he offered sacrifices and burnt incense on high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices for that was the most important high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God says, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, but I am only a little child. Do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God says to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands as David, your father, did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke and he realized it had been a dream. May God add a blessing to the hearer, reader, and doer of his holy word. And today, as we start this amazing study, I want to use for a sermon, in position for God's yes. In position for God's yes. This account almost seems too easy. Have you ever seen someone doing something that's very difficult, but they make it seem so easy that it seems that anybody can do it? They even make you believe that you can do it. This is why you see people getting injured, performing gymnastics stunts or motorcycle stunts. And one of my favorite games is the game of golf, watching how it seems to be effortless, hitting the ball straight and making it go this way or that way. So you buy the same clubs, get the clothes, the same balls that they use, but when you hit the ball, it goes in every rich direction but straight. And you say to yourself, something else must be going on here that I was not told about. And we soon realized that there was a lot of work that went into making it look that easy. We desire the result without putting in the work. As it is with Solomon, looking at this account, it seems very logical and reasonable that he would ask for wisdom. It seems like the right thing to do. We even think to ourselves after reading in the account, you know, I would have asked for the same thing. But would we have asked for the same thing? Better yet, have we asked for the same thing? It seems almost too easy to get God to say yes. So people read this account and think, well, this was so easy that I can just ask God anything and get him to say yes. But what we will learn from this account today is that a lot went into getting God to say yes. And that will be the focus of our time today, being in position for God's yes. We spend the good part of our life hoping to hear this word made up of only three letters. We are most often on a quest to secure it and will go to almost any length to hear this word. And whether you realize it or not, you began this quest at a very early age. Some of you, as I speak, Hard at work trying to figure out what this word is. So if you haven't already figured it out, it is the word yes. And guess what? Children figure this out very quickly. They scream for food. They cry for toys. They throw fits. For many people, it seems this same strategy has continued into adulthood. But as we grow to adolescent years, we get crafty in getting to yes. We play one parent versus the other parent. Dad, can I go outside and play? 
No, you have to do your chores around the house. Then they immediately go to, into the room and, mom, can I go? Yes, I don't mind, but be back at a reasonable hour. And you get back and dad says, I thought I told you, but mom said I could. So as we see, what is at the root of many requests is not a desire to please the giver of the yes, but our desire is to please ourselves no matter what the cost. We see this in a story that I read about a little boy named Leroy, who for his birthday, he wanted a new bike. So he pleaded with his mother and she looked at him with stern eyes and says, Leroy, you have been very disobedient lately and I don't feel you deserve a new bike. But I'm gonna tell you what, why don't you go upstairs to your room and you write a letter to Jesus and you tell him why you deserve a bike. So he went up to his room and began to write, Jesus, this is Leroy. I've been a good boy this year and I deserve a new bicycle for my birthday. Please send one signed Leroy. But after putting a little thought into what he had written, he just crumbled up the paper and threw it away and began a second letter. Jesus, this is Leroy again. I've been a pretty good boy this year and probably should get a new bike for my birthday. Please send one signed Leroy. But after putting even more thought into what he had just written, crumbled up the paper of the second letter and threw it in the wastebasket. And in a flash, he ran down the stairs and headed straight to the front door. His mother yells, Leroy, where are you going? He says, I'm going to church, mom. And Leroy's mother was feeling really good about the situation. Maybe she had finally gotten through to her disobedient child. Leroy ran down to the corner church, the Catholic church, and he headed right through the steps. And he went through the front door around to see if anybody was there. And of course, there wasn't, it wasn't the regular time that they meet and no one was there. And he looked around and he spotted a small statue near the altar. He approached it very cautiously, looking around to see if anybody was watching him. He grabbed the statue, put it under his jacket and ran back home. When he came through the front door, he headed straight up the stairs to his bedroom. He sat down at his desk to pen a third letter. He says, Jesus, Leroy here, I got your mama. Please send the bike or else, signed Leroy. Isn't it amazing how extreme we get just to get someone to yes? Our desires have gotten so insatiable that answers of no or weight have become unacceptable, which in many regards shows that as we get older, we don't mature. Even in several church doctrines, many have perverted the gospel message to feed our insatiable yes desire. They go to John 14 and 13 and says, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. That the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. This abuse scripture used out of context is reckless teaching, and it promotes attempts to bribe God and attempts to con God. Why? Because at the root of this reckless teaching is the mindset that God will never say no to us. And it's always explained, well, God is saying no because you're not giving enough money to the church. And I won't even continue to comment on that foolish teaching. But how do we position ourselves for a yes from God? Do we treat God like Leroy and try to force him into saying yes? Do we ever try to bribe God into seeing things our way? Now, we should all agree that sometimes God doesn't say yes, no matter how badly we want him to, because it's for our own good. But more times than not, God wants to say yes to us. But the problem is we fail to ask for the right things. I think James 4 explains it best. And the King James Version says, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. The New Living Translation makes it clear, saying, and yet the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your whole motive is wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. And in Matthew 21, 22, and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. So with that thought in mind, how do we position ourselves for God's yes? If we stop and think about it, 
Solomon has the answer for us this morning. So to be in position for God's yes, we must first of all learn to love the Lord. Verse three says Solomon loved the Lord. In fact, when our Lord established the New Testament church, one of the principles it was founded upon was Matthew 22 and 37. It says the greatest commandment says you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Until we learn to love the Lord like Solomon loved the Lord, we will never understand how to receive God's favor. God loved Solomon and Solomon loved him back. There are many who desire the benefits of a love relationship, but are only willing to settle for acquaintance status. Like the guy who is really in love with the girl, but she doesn't want to give him the time of day and he pursues her, he calls her, but she's just not very interested. Then he backs off and just says, well, it's not going to work out. And she's relieved because the pursuit has stopped. Then all of a sudden, a few months later, this young man gets a call out of nowhere from this girl saying, hey, I know it's been a while. Don't you have a truck? Because I'm moving. And I was just wondering if you could. And church, we try to deal with the Lord the same way. To call him only when we need him instead of calling him because we love him. We are very reciprocal by nature in the way that we show love. And God loves first, and we are expected to reciprocate that same love for the Lord. We have a long way to go and can never match his love, but we can give all that we have. And when we do, that will position us for God's yes. We must also. Number two, learn to follow the Lord. Verse three also says, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. We must take every available opportunity to learn how to follow God if we are to secure favor of a yes from God. Before his death, David spoke these words to his young son that would occupy the throne of Israel and keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statute, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and whatever you turn. You and I have a responsibility to follow the Lord no matter where it leads us because that final destination is always in the will of God. There is favor in following. Did you hear that? There is favor in following. When we live this principle, it will cause us to be doers of the word. We tend to only want to follow the Lord where it's convenient. But when we give our lives to Jesus, we will go places we would not have gone otherwise. And we do it out of our undying love for God. Positioning ourselves for God's yes will also come when we learn to serve the Lord. Now, verse four says, now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Church, we must develop the heart of a servant. Here stood a young man that ruled over all Israel, and yet he never forgot who the ruler of the universe was. He served the Lord with the gladness described in Psalms 100 when it says, serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. Solomon went to Gibeon to serve the Lord on that day. You are here this morning tuning in because it's the word of God where you find out where God wants you to serve him. We find favor in being a doer of the word. When we understand this principle, we'll realize that it's not what we get, but what we give is what matters. When we love the Lord and learn to follow the Lord, we will begin to develop the heart of a servant. Therefore, our first thought in a situation will not be what we get out of it. Positioning ourselves for a yes from God we will further have to learn to listen to the Lord. Learn to listen to the Lord. Verse five says, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and God says, ask, what shall I give you? God has something to say if we would just listen and learn 
we will be blessed. I've got to tell you, some people are really good at being selective listeners. Kids are like that. You tell them something and 30 minutes or an hour later, you can ask them if they have done what you've asked them to do. And most of the time they'll say, well, I, di I didn't hear you say that. So we give them a reminder. The problem is we all have selective hearing. We tend to listen to what we think is beneficial to us and we ignore the rest. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, for the word of God is living and active sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirits, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Church, we must digest the complete word of God for growth and healing. We tend to shy away from portions of the word that we struggle with and only quote the happy scriptures. We particularly need to meditate on those scriptures that speak to issues of sin that are present in our lives. If we want healing, we need to take our medicine as prescribed by a physician. And it will show when we're not taking the medicine as prescribed because we will not get better, we will get worse. Hence, with the word of God, if it's prescribed to be taken daily, and we're not taking it as prescribed, it will show in our actions because we will not get better, but progressively worse and things around us also will be a mess. There was a reason God decided to come to Solomon that night. Solomon's dream was nothing more than an extension of his fervent desire for wisdom in reality. The very things that we dwell on every day are the real desires of our heart. Listen to Psalms 37 and 4. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Church, we have blessings waiting on us. God wants to say yes. He wants to bring it to pass. But first, we have to learn to listen. When we understand this principle, we reach the very heart of God. And through this process, we, number five, learn what to ask of the Lord. If we want God to say yes to our requests, then we had better learn what it is that God loves to say yes to. Before we tell God what we want, we ought to consider these guidelines. In Matthew 6 and 33, it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. In verses 11 through 14, God says yes to Solomon because Solomon's request was right. He asked God for the wisdom and ability to do what God had already called him to do. When our request is for God to give us the wisdom and ability to do what he has already called us to do in accordance to Matthew 6, all these things will be added unto you. When we understand this principle, it will give us the desire to live every day in the will of God. When we do a survey of our request to the Lord, are those things we are asking putting us in position to do a greater work for God? Are they to serve our neighbor in a greater capacity? Or is our request just to serve self and the flesh? God says yes to Solomon because Solomon asked for God's will to be done. As a result, Solomon became the most blessed man on the face of the earth. When we ask for God's will and God's wisdom to work in our lives, the answer will always be yes. But I suppose the most important thing this morning is whether or not we will say yes to God. God is ready to say yes to us. But are we ready to say yes to God? God has put it on your heart to serve and be faithful in all areas of ministry. But are we ready to say yes to God in that capacity? He has commanded sacrificial giving to further the ministry he has called you to. Are we ready to say yes to God? He puts opportunities to witness in front of us to say yes to God. With the blessings from God, there is an expectation to live out those blessings. When Solomon asked for wisdom, it was granted. And the expectation was for him to live by that wisdom. 
When you sought a church home and God led you to third, God expected you to work. When you sought God for a job, he blessed you with one. God expects you to work because you're working for him. When God blessed you with your spiritual gifts, he expects you to use them in his name and to his glory. We so want God to continue to say yes to us. We must be willing to say yes to God. God is calling, requesting, asking today for your heart, your obedience, your commitment, your service. What will your answer be? I pray that your answer will be a resounding yes to God. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Yes, God, I will trust. Yes, God, I will obey. I want to thank you for tuning in today. Next week, we're going to continue our study in 1 Kings with a sermon titled, Lessons from a Prostitute Story. I pray that you join us as we continue to grow spiritually with our study of the Word of God. Until then, remember, be patient, be kind, be compassionate with everyone you come in contact with this week. This week, let us focus on giving God our yes. God bless you and God keep you. Long ago, I didn't know nothing about Jesus and his love, but I heard about, I heard about that man from up above, oh, in his life of sin, I couldn't no longer stand, I asked my mother, I said, how I do I get to know the man? She said, you must be, you got to be, you know 